since the most recent appointments to the Vatican's schismatic way and dicastery for the destruction of the faith, a.k.a. the office formerly known as Holy, many pious Catholics have been struggling even more, including doubting the Roman dogma of the indestructibility, the indefectibility of the church. Today on the Guild Family Stream, we discuss this in detail and we talk about it from the authoritative sources. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in Sequila. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meeting of Catholic Jesus is King. Welcome to the Guild Family Streams. As always, the first few minutes of this will be released publicly to promote Guild membership. If you want the full thing, you have to become a Guild member. Meaningofcatholic.com slash register. As always, as well, not everything I say or anybody says on Meaning of Catholic is agreed upon by everyone here. This is a collaborative apostolate. We all collaborate and we present our apostolic work, which is exterior to the guild community, to the public in order to fulfill the goals of this apostolate, which is uniting Catholics against the enemies of the Holy Church. And one of those things in particular is to encourage the doubtful. That's the spiritual work of mercy. And so this stream in particular is, is going to be working on encouraging the doubtful. But some topics we also need to really deal with in-house in our guild community, um, especially so people can be honest. Um, our guild community is an international community of Catholics fighting against the Marxists together and helping each other which is designed to support us in a time where we don't have Christendom to support us. We've got our local parish, we've got our families, but we don't have Christendom per se if you live outside Liechtenstein or various other pockets of Christendom or St. Mary's, Kansas, or that sort of thing. So this, this guild community is meant to support that. What is a guild? That was actually one of the questions for this guild family stream. And to answer that, we don't we can't give you a full treatment in this broadcast but i recommend everyone go over to our friends at bonday radio and he uh, bonday radio has a two-part conversation with um two others um discussing the history of the guilds this is very very important and why are the guilds well first what is a guild why is it important a guild is a confraternity of prayer among lay people first and foremost it's a confraternity of prayer among lay people our guild is dedicated to Our Lady of Victory, who united a bunch of lay people against the Mohammedans, the enemies of the Holy Church, in 1571. Um, and this is uh, our confraternity of prayer invokes our lay patrons, who are Our Lady of Victory, Our Lady of Victory, Mary Queen of the Home, Saint Joseph, Terror of Demons, and Saint Anthony of the Desert. Um, and we invoke these patrons in order to imitate them. Are the central confraternity is our, our central group. So anybody who's a part of the guild, we, we should we should all be invoking our lay patrons every single day. That's that's the bare requirement of prayer uh, in this confraternity of prayer is to invoke our lay patrons every single day. It takes about 10 seconds or less. Um, and it's also required that you contribute financially because we just, for example, we just signed up for the, the business Zoom account, which costs $150 a year so that we can have a watch party. We can all watch the the new Polish film on the Latin mass, which is going to be, uh, it's already out, but we're going to watch it together on Saturday, July 22nd. And we're going to have two time zones represented too. We're going to do it at 9 a.m. Central European time. And that is going to be hosted by Dr. Jennifer Bryson. Uh, so that'll be at 9 a.m. Central European time, which will also catch our brethren over in Oceania. And then I will do another time as well in Eastern time, but I don't know what time yet because I have to schedule something with a, someone who from out of town that same day. But we will have the watch party on July 22nd. So that costs money. So we have costs, not only costs to our income, like income for the Flanders family, we also have costs to pay the bills to run this whole apostolate. So that's why we ask you to contribute financially. So this is a guild where it's a confraternity of prayer which flows into an economic support. That's what a guild is. So it's a confraternity of prayer, which becomes an economic cooperation. That's, I think, the, the basic, the most basic um, definition of a guild is that it's a confraternity of prayer, which becomes an economic cooperation. And 
what so practically speaking how did this arise well in in the the age of christendom or the age of first christendom as i discussed it in my book uh, falsely called pejoratively the so-called middle ages we should abandon that term because it's a it's an anti-christian term uh, but in that period of first christendom first western christendom um men and women were banding together to pray in in your local village your local community and it's essential to remember that Lay people do not need permission from clerics to come together to pray. They don't, this is this is what lay people should be doing freely without any prohibition from a cleric. Not that we disregard the clerics or want to exclude them. It's simply to mean that in our age of, of clericalism, we sometimes make the mistake that we do need that permission. We don't need that permit. The cleric, I mean, clerics just don't even, even all the good clerics, they just don't have time to go through all these things. They don't have time for it. There's, I mean, think of the number of lay people, just practically speaking, if all of our clergy were perfectly orthodox, the number of lay people that they'd have to deal with if they needed permission for all these groups. Anyways, so what happens is a confraternity of prayer arises in a village, in a community, a locale, whatever. And they're praying every Friday in their devotion to the precious blood or whatever. But then one of their members dies. And he leaves his widow and children. So then the confraternity realizes, wait a second, we should all pitch in and help his widow and child. And that's where the economic cooperation comes in. And so then they all pitch together and they, they provide something for the widow and children. Because in Christendom, there was no welfare, Social Security, Medicaid, whatever. It was all flowing from the culture of Christendom. The culture of Christendom provided for the poor and the widows and the orphans. Another example of this, that one of my favorites is that uh, Christopher Dawson points out, is that there was no police force in Christendom, no police force. So how did they deal with, you know, robbers and whatever? Well, what happened was in Christian villages, they would make a confraternity of prayer and they would commit and make an oath together. All the men in a community, they would make an oath to keep the peace. So they would, all, they themselves, the community themselves, the civilians, so to speak, they would keep the peace. They were the police force. You know, we, th we think about in, in the United States, there's controversy over gun control. Well, if, if we had Christendom, no man would dare start to open fire on people because he would immediately be taken down by all the men who were present at that, at, uh, that event. Um, and th this is, I tell the story a few times and at my parish, uh, we actually had a, a disturbance in our mass. It, was, it turned out to be nothing, thankfully, but it was actually a mentally impaired individual who started yelling at mass. Um, and so it was, there was really no, no actual threat, but as soon as that happened, there were like six men who just rushed him and he was, if he was a threat, he would have been taken down immediately. Um, so this is the type of economic cooperation and, and the most famous example of this in terms of the guilds are the various artisan guilds, the various craftsmen, um, masons, the, the true masons, meaning workers in, in stone. Those masons were guilds. Um, and this comes from a confraternity of prayer. But in the culture of Christendom, it comes from a desire that their work may glorify God. This is most conspicuously seen on the on the roofs of these cathedrals on the roofs. There are certain things that are etched in for the glory of God, which no one has ever seen until we have modern technology and we can go look at those things with a helicopter or whatever, or a crane or whatever, because these masons or these various artisans or whatever, were, were doing these things for the glory of God. So uh, a great example, I have a quote in my book and I don't have it ready, but a great example is when you become a, uh, a tradesman of some kind, uh, there was a guild oath. So you would take an oath to make your, do your job to the excellent, to the, with great excellence for the glory of God. And you would commit to various spiritual practices. And this was how economic cooperation worked. So we can go on, but I re recommend you go and watch those videos because, um, yeah, Brian says paid masons, not Freemasons. That's, that's, that's the perfect way to explain those. Yes. The paid masons, not the Freemasons. Yes. Um, so anyway, so, um, we're going to talk about the indefectibility of the church and I just want everybody to be able to be honest 
you know, if they're having doubts or whatever, uh, so we can talk about this privately as a guild community. Um, that's one of the reasons that we um, do these streams uh, so we can we can have this community. Um, so if you want the whole treatment discussing in detail the indefectibility of the church, um, here's a preview about what what we'll discuss. Uh, I've I've reviewed the authoritative sources. I've also talked with two different theologians about this topic. Um, one of the interesting things is that Ludwig Ott only puts this dogma as a sententia certa. It's actually not a dogma, according to Ludwig Ott. It's not a dogma. It's a sententia certa. What is that? It's a doctrine of a lower level, which may not be binding potentially. Sententia certa is the fourth level in the traditional six levels of the theological notes. And that means it could be a dispute as to whether or not this is a binding doctrine or not in the particular way that it is enunciated. And I think this is very wise about of Ludwig Ott, and we'll discuss that. But we're also going to talk about uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia. We'll look at Summa Theologicae Sacrae in the 1950s. We'll also look at the O.P., um, De Groot. We'll look at um, Pope Leo the Thirteenth Satis Cognitum. This is a very important document, and Ponti uh, Leo Thirteenth Pontificate is extremely important because of this thing right here, the Epistola Tua controversy in 1885. If you've never heard of the Epistola Tua controversy in 1885, that is a very, very central and crucial thing to understand about the modern church. This happened under Leo the Thirteenth, and it's extremely important to understand these things. So. Um, this is critical. Uh, I think, um, this is important. So we'll talk about that and we'll also talk about some other topics. So if you want to be a part of the guild, go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register for the full treatment.